In this video, we're going to cover the transport functions of membranes. We're going to break down passive transport, active transport, osmosis, and bulk transport. Let's get started. Cells need to be able to exchange molecules with their surroundings to develop and survive. They need to import nutrients like carbohydrates and amino acids, as well as get rid of metabolic waste. Before we go through the different types of transport, let's first look at the structure of plasma membranes, because this structure is what separates a cell from its surroundings and controls the movement of substances between the extracellular fluid, or the exterior of the cell, and the cytoplasm, or the interior of the cell. It helps regulate what comes in or out of cells, as well as performs as well as performs other important functions such as cell recognition. Now, you may have heard of the fluid mosaic model, which describes the arrangement or structure of the plasma membrane. This model describes the structure of membranes as a mosaic of components consisting of two layers of phospholipid molecules with other molecules including proteins, carbohydrates, and cholesterol. And these components are able to flow and change position while maintaining the basic structure of the membrane. Let's zoom in on the structure of a phospholipid here. Okay, it's composed of a hydrophilic or polar head containing a negatively charged phosphate and glycerol, and two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. Hydrophilic means it likes water, and their tail is hydrophobic or lipophilic, meaning it doesn't like water but loves fats or fat. These tails can be saturated fatty acid or unsaturated fatty acid tails. I mentioned how there are two fatty acid tails. One of these hydrocarbon tails typically contains only single bonds between its adjacent carbon atoms, while the other tail may have one or more double bonds. The chain with a double bond is considered to be unsaturated in hydrogen, since it doesn't contain the full number of hydrogen atoms that may theoretically be connected to its carbon backbone. So what's going to happen is it's going to give a slight kink, okay, this here, to the unsaturated tail created by each double bond, whereas a saturated hydrocarbon tail contains a full complement of hydrogen atoms and no double bonds. So there's no kink, it's just straight tails, okay? So a phospholipid is an amphipathic molecule, meaning it has both a hydrophilic, water-loving region and a hydrophobic or water-fearing region. And this is important in organizing lipid molecules into bilayers. In water, phospholipids form a bilayer where the hydrophobic tails are oriented inwards because they don't like water, okay? So they're going to be inside in the interior. And the hydrophilic heads are oriented outwards. It's in constant contact with aqueous solutions on either side. This is why water-soluble or polar molecules aren't able to cross membranes easily, which we'll break down later in the lecture. Now, Nothing stops membrane lipids from moving around and swapping places with one another. They're quite free. These lipid molecules are able to move within their own monolayer. And this is very crucial for cell membranes to function properly. The fluidity of cell membranes is crucial for the activity of transport molecules and enzymes within the membranes here. Fluidity is the ease with which its lipid molecules move within and across the bilayer. So membrane fluidity is important for all cells. We won't be talking about fluidity if it weren't important. And how fluid a lipid bilayer is at a given temperature depends on the phospholipid composition, specifically the structure of the hydrocarbon tails. So the more closely packed the hydrocarbon tails are, the more viscous and less fluid the bilayer will be. And this is where cholesterol comes in. In animal cells, the presence of cholesterol controls the fluidity of the membrane. It alters the fluidity. So let's take a closer look at the structure of cholesterol first before discussing its importance. Look at this gorgeous being here. Cholesterol fits into the gaps between phospholipids, okay? There's a polar head group, a steroid ring structure, and a non-polar tail. 
Now, cholesterol may fill the spaces between these molecules because of its short and rigid steroid ring structure. So we have two phospholipids here, and in the middle, we have cholesterol. What cholesterol does is it acts as a buffer for changing temperatures. At lower, temperature, at lower temperatures, cholesterol prevents the plasma membrane from solidifying by restricting these phospholipids from packing closely and tightly together. And at higher temperatures, it's going to stop the plasma membrane from becoming too fluid. It's going to restrict the movement of phospholipids. Cholesterol is going to pull these phospholipids together, cuddling them closer together. Okay, because we don't want them moving around. We don't want phospholipids to separate from one another because it's going to make the membrane weak and leaky. That's the lipid bilayer. We mentioned before that plasma membranes have various proteins embedded within it. Let's go through this. There are two types of proteins within, plasma mem within the plasma membrane. We have integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Integral proteins span the membrane bilayer. They can span the entire bilayer or extend only partway into the hydrophobic region. Integral proteins that span both the layers are also called transmembrane proteins, okay? These proteins have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. The hydrophilic areas are exposed to the aqueous environment on one or both sides of the membrane. Let's go through their functions. These proteins can act as transport channels for molecules and ions through the membrane, which you'll see later on. It's quite exciting. They can function as enzymes to catalyze certain membrane reactions. It's also involved in signal transduction or cell-to-cell -cell recognition. They can also act as attachments to the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. The other type of membrane protein is the peripheral protein. These proteins are not embedded into the phospholipid bilayer. They are found on the inner or outer edge of the membrane. They are loosely linked to the membrane surface. All right, those are the proteins. One last component are the carbohydrates. They are found on the exterior surface of cells and are bound to other proteins, forming glycoproteins, or they are bound to lipids, forming glycolipids. They form sites, specialized sites on the cell surface that allow cells to recognize each other. Okay? So we've covered the structure of the plasma membrane. Let's now subtract complexity and go through one of the most important properties of membranes, and that is their ability to regulate what comes in or out of the cell. This is called selective permeability. The cell membrane is semi-permeable. This means that it allows some molecules to pass through, but not others. And it's mostly based on the molecule's size, charge, and polarity. If membranes lost their selectivity, the cell would be unable to maintain itself and would be destroyed. We don't want that, okay? So depending on the size and polarity of molecules, they either diffuse between the phospholipid molecules or pass through channels and transporters created by the membrane proteins. And for bigger molecules such as proteins and polysaccharides, bulk transport is used. Endocytosis for transport into cells or exocytosis if the molecules are to be transported out of cells. Like we mentioned before, the way in which molecules move across the membrane depends on their chemical properties, such as size, charge, and polarity, and whether or not the bilayer is permeable to the substance. Because referring back to the interior of the plasma membrane, it's made up of a bilayer that is hydrophobic. The hydrophobic tails are oriented inwards. So small nonpolar molecules such as oxygen and carbon dioxide can cross the lipid bilayer readily and rapidly. The membrane is permeable to these substances. Small and uncharged polar molecules also cross the bilayer readily, such as water. The membrane is also permeable to lipid-soluble nonpolar molecules such as steroids. Okay, it loves fats. And these are some examples of molecules in which the membrane is permeable. When it comes to highly impermeable substances, these include all charged substances, including all inorganic ions. So think potassium, sodium, chloride, and calcium. Ions pass through protein channels, no matter if they are small. We'll go through why this is the case in a minute. 
and for larger polar and water solubles such as amino acids and glucose, these molecules pass through protein channels as well. Now, the term polar means there is an electronegative, <laughs> electronegativity difference between the bonded atoms. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons more readily. The more electronegative an atom is, the more strongly it's going to attract shared electrons toward itself. So polar molecules, the electrons are shared unequally, and there are going to be regions of slightly positive and negative charges, whereas nonpolar means that the atoms share the electrons almost equally. And the reason why the lipid bilayer doesn't allow ions to pass through is due to their charges and their strong chemical electrical attraction to water molecules. An atom that has a charge has a surrounding shell of water or a hydration shell, which is why it can't pass through. If we look at the structure of water real quick, oxygen molecules have a partial negative charge and hydrogen molecules have a partial positive charge, which means other polar molecules and ions bind with them. All right, this is just an overview picture. Let's break this down further. There are two ways that molecules can be moved across a membrane. It can occur by passive transport, which requires no energy, or active transport, which requires energy in the form of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Let's go through passive transport first. There are three types of passive transport. We have diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Like we mentioned before, it doesn't require the cell to exert any of its energy. What happens in passive transport is that substances move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. This is referred to as a concentration gradient. It's this space or region that has a range of concentrations of a single substance. The substance's concentration either increases or decreases. In diffusion, a single substance tends to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until the concentration is equal across the space, okay? Substances diffuse down their own concentration gradients, and this is a spontaneous process. Again, we don't need an input of energy. An important example is the uptake of oxygen for cellular respiration. Oxygen diffuses into the cell across the plasma membrane. Diffusion into the cell will continue as long as cellular respiration uses up oxygen as it enters because the concentration gradient encourages movement in that direction. But the question is, what causes this? Because the motion of molecules is purely random. Let's break this down. Molecules of any substance, whether solid, liquid, or gas, are always in a continuous state of movement or vibration. They are always moving. And this energy comes from heat. The warmer a substance is, the faster its molecules move. It's got a lot of energy. Focusing on solutions, moving molecules cannot travel very far without clashing with other molecules. It's always going to be moving. And every collision changes the directions in which molecules or the molecule is moving, making every molecule's path unpredictable. Which is why the motion of molecules is purely random, because they can move in any direction at any given time. So the motion of molecules in a liquid or gas will eventually disperse the molecules evenly throughout a container. So here, a solute is more concentrated in one region, and the random thermal motion will redistribute the solute from regions of higher concentrations to lower concentrations. The amount of material that crosses a surface in a given amount of time is known as a flux. Now, let's say I had two compartments here of equal volume, and they were separated by a permeable membrane, okay? This middle line here. So we have compartment one and compartment two. These molecules here, let's say these are glucose molecules. This one-way flux of glucose from compartment one to compartment two depends on the concentration of glucose in compartment one. And after a while, some of the glucose molecules that have traveled to compartment two will randomly move back to compartment one. And the amount of glucose that is transferred from compartment two to compartment one depends on the amount of glucose that is present in compartment two at any one time. 
Okay, so the difference between the two one-way fluxes shows the net flux of glucose between the two compartments at any given time. And the levels or concentrations, I should say, of glucose in the two compartments eventually balance out. It becomes equal. They will still move randomly from one compartment to the other, but the net flux of glucose is zero since the two one-way fluxes are now equal. Beautiful. This is what's known as diffusion equilibrium. Due to the same rates of diffusion in both directions between the two compartments, there won't be any further changes in the glucose concentrations of the two compartments. Applying the concept of diffusion to living organisms, there are many biological processes that are intimately related to diffusion. For example, the passage of oxygen and nutrients across plasma membranes. All right? Let's go through the factors that affect diffusion. The first factor is the magnitude of the concentration gradient. The greater the difference, the faster diffusion moves. The rate of diffusion slows down when the material distribution approaches equilibrium. The next factor is the mass of the molecules. So larger molecules such as proteins have a greater mass and move more slower than smaller molecules such as glucose. The third is temperature. So like we mentioned before, a higher temperature increases the movement of molecules and a lower temperature decreases the rate of diffusion. Recall what we covered before, the molecules are always in constant movement and vibration. The warmer it is, the faster the molecules move. Another factor is surface area. The more surface area there is between two regions, the more space available for diffusion, and so the faster the net flux. Next up is solvent density. As the density of a solvent increases, the rate of diffusion decreases because the molecules slow down. It's like when you're running in the cold, you're a lot slower than if it was in a warmer weather. For example, cells use diffusion to move materials within the cytoplasm. If we were to increase the cytoplasm's density, this would hinder the movement of the materials. Another important factor is distance. Okay, so we've covered the direction and magnitude of solute diffusion across a membrane in terms of the solute's concentration difference across the membrane. Let's now break down the diffusion of ions through ion channels. Ions such as sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium. Earlier, we covered the two major types of membrane proteins, and the integral membrane proteins can span the lipid bilayer, and some of these proteins form ion channels that allow ions to pass through or diffuse across the membrane. Now, ion channels can exhibit selectivity for the kind of ion or ions that can diffuse them, diffuse through them. This is due to the channel diameter, the charge, and polar surfaces of the subunits, the polypeptide subunits that make up the channel walls and electrically attract or repel ions, as well as the quantity of water molecules linked to the ions. Recall that an atom that has a charge has a surrounding shell of water or a hydration shell, which simply is just a sphere of water molecules around each ion. For example, some channels allow only potassium ions to pass through. These are called potassium channels, and there are also channels specifically for sodium ions. Okay? Let's break this down further. In most cells, there is a separation of electrical charge across the plasma membranes. This is known as a membrane potential. This is due to an uneven distribution of anions and cations on the two sides. The cytoplasmic side of the membrane has a negative charge in comparison to the extracellular side. The minus sign here indicates that the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside. Okay, And so because the inside of the cell is negative, the membrane potential favors the passive transport of cations or positive ions into the cell and anions out of the cell. As a result, two forces, a chemical force, which is the ion's concentration gradient, and an electrical force, the impact of the membrane potential on the ion's movement, drive the diffusion of ions across a membrane. Okay, And if we combine these two forces that interact with an ion, this is called the electrochemical gradient. And so an ion diffuses down its electrochemical gradient. Let's show some ions here and go through them. 
The most common positively charged ion, or cation, outside of the cell is sodium, whereas the most common one within is potassium. The amount of positive charge inside a cell must be balanced by an equivalent amount of negative charge. And the same is maintained for the charge in the surrounding environment, in order for the cell to resist being torn apart by electrical forces. So the high concentration of sodium ions outside the cell is electrically balanced primarily by extracellular chloride ions. Okay, And the high concentration of potassium ions inside the cell is balanced by a variety of negatively charged ions. This can include, this can include proteins and other cell metabolites. And if you recall, like charges repel each other and opposites attract. So the excess negative charges inside the cell attract the positive charges outside the cell. And so the surfaces of the plasma membrane tend to align the opposing charges. For example, as we mentioned, let's say the inside of a cell has a net negative charge compared to the exterior. There will be an electrical force attracting positive ions into the cell and repelling negative ions. So we're going to be drawing in these positive ions and repelling these negative ions here. As a result, the direction and amount of ion fluxes across membranes are determined by the electrical and concentration differences. All right? Okay. Now, Ion channels can be open or closed, and when they open or closed, they can quickly modify how permeable a membrane is to ions. So this right here is an open ion channel. It's open for business. And this one is a closed ion channel. It's closed for business. This is called channel gating. It's the process of opening and closing ion channels, and an ion channel can open and close many times, which means the channel protein alternates between these conformations, open or closed. <sighs> okay, let's go through the factors that can change the conformation the conformations of the channel protein. First, the binding of particular chemicals to channel proteins may result in an allosteric or covalent alterations in the shape of the channel protein, either directly or indirectly. A substance that binds to a protein like this is called a ligand. So these channels are known as ligand-gated ion channels. Second factor, changes in the membrane potential can cause particular charge sections on a channel protein to shift, changing the shape of the protein, and these charged regions are found on voltage-gated ion channels. And another factor, some channel proteins which some channel proteins which are mechanically gated ion channels they might change in conformation as a result of physically deforming or stretching the membrane okay so a single ion may pass through several types of channels if the membrane is present with these types so for example potassium channels that are ligand gated voltage gated or mechanically gated can all be found in membranes. All right, that's diffusion through ion channels. Let's go through how other molecules, including amino acids and glucose, cross the lipid bilayer, because they are too large to just diffuse through channels. These molecules, okay, these gorgeous molecules, are transported through integral membrane proteins known as transporters or carrier proteins. These methods are referred to as mediated transport, which rely on conformational changes in these transporters. Let's break this down. Okay, molecules can move through by entering the transporter on one side and exiting on the other, allowing them to move in either direction. Before a solute can be transported, it must first attach to a certain location on a transporter protein. Okay, this right here, this is the binding site, which is exposed to the solute on one membrane surface. Then a section of the transporter changes right here, revealing this identical binding site to the solution on the other side of the membrane. And the process of transporting the substance through the bilayer is finished when it dissociates from the transporter binding site. So it's quite similar to ion channels. The only main difference is that ion channels can move more ions per unit time, 
than transporters because a transporter first has to change its shape for each molecule. Whereas an ion channel can just open its gate without needing to change its shape. It just opens and shuts, okay? Whereas a transporter, it has to change shape. Let's go through the factors that influence the flux through a mediated transport system. Firstly, the solute concentration. Then we have the quantity of transporters in the membrane and the affinity of the transporters for the solute and also the rate of conformational change in the transport protein all play a role. And this leads us to the second type of diffusion called facilitated diffusion. Similar to simple diffusion, substances move from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration, and it doesn't require energy. The difference is that facilitated diffusion uses a transporter to move materials down their concentration gradient, so it uses a mediated transport system. The membrane transport proteins are specific for particular substances, and when the concentration of the solute increases, the transport proteins can become fully occupied. There are two main types of membrane proteins in facilitated diffusion. We have channel proteins and carrier proteins. Like we mentioned before, channel proteins are specific for a substance and they don't need to bind to the molecules being transported. Whereas carrier proteins bind the molecules being transported, causing a conformational change. Ion channels open and close, carrier proteins, they have to change shape. It it's these shape changes that allow the specific substances to be transported across the membrane. After it's crossed the bilayer, the protein is restored to its original shape. All right? A great example that uses facilitated diffusion is the glucose transporters that transport glucose across plasma membranes. Okay, that's facilitated diffusion. The other type of diffusion is osmosis, but we'll break that down later. Let's go through the second type of transport, and that is active transport, which uses energy in the form of ATP. In active transport, energy is used to move a substance uphill across a membrane. So we're going against the substance concentration gradient. We're going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, which is why it's against the concentration gradient. Similar to facilitated diffusion, a substance needs to bind to the transporter in the membrane. And because we're moving substances uphill, these transporters are known as pumps because we're pumping substances from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. We're going uphill, so we're gonna be using a pump. These transporters are also very specific to the molecules they transport, and they can become saturated, similar to facilitated diffusion. There are two ways that energy can be coupled to transporters. We have primary active transport and secondary active transport. Primary active transport is driven directly by ATP, whereas secondary active transport is driven by an electrochemical gradient across a membrane. Let's go through primary active transport first. Okay. The energy for primary active transport is produced by a transporter's hydrolysis of ATP. The transporter is an enzyme called ATPase, and this enzyme catalyzes the breakdown of ATP while also phosphorylating itself. We're going to be adding a phosphate group to this enzyme. This is a phosphorylation process that alters the shape of the transporter and the affinity of the transporter's solute binding site. Okay? A great example is the movement of sodium and potassium ions across plasma membranes by the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. This transporter is present in all cells and it moves sodium from intracellular to extracellular fluid and potassium in the opposite direction. We're going to break this down into six steps like a picture storybook, okay? <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous. So this right here is the extracellular fluid that has a high sodium ion concentration and a low potassium ion concentration. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be pumping ions against their concentration gradient. We're moving sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. Focusing on our first chapter here, our first step, cytoplasmic ions, cytoplasmic sodium ions, binds to the sodium potassium pump. Specifically, three sodium ions are first bound by the transporter at high affinity regions on the intracellular surface of the protein. 
And right here, we also have two additional potassium binding sites as well, but they are now in a low affinity state and are unable to bind intracellular potassium, okay? That's our first chapter. Moving on to the second chapter of our story, when three sodium ions bind, the transporter protein's innate ATPase activity is activated, okay? We're gonna be activating this enzyme, resulting in phosphorylation of the transporter's systolic surface and the release of an ADP molecule. Here's our cute ADP molecule here. So we're gonna be releasing an ADP molecule and phosphorylating, we're gonna be adding a phosphate group to the enzyme, this right here. This will then cause the transporter's conformation to alter, okay? And the bound sodium will be exposed to the extracellular fluid, lowering the binding site's affinity for sodium, and the sodium will be released, okay? So adding a phosphate group here leads to a change in protein shape, reducing its affinity for sodium, and we're going to be releasing three sodium ions outside. Then the altered shape or conformation of the transporter causes the two potassium binding sites right here to have a higher affinity for potassium, which enables two potassium to attach to the transporter on the extracellular surface. So two potassium ions bind on the extracellular side, triggering the release of the phosphate group, okay? As soon as we bind the potassium ions, the phosphate group is going to be released. The transporter becomes dephosphorylated as a result of potassium binding, and we're going to remove the phosphate group. By doing so, the transporter is brought back to its original conformation, its original shape, which increases the affinity of the sodium binding sites while decreasing the affinity of the potassium binding sites. As a result, potassium is going to be discharged into the intracellular fluid, these green ions, allowing for the binding of more sodium and ATP to the intracellular surface and the cycle repeats itself. We're going to be repeating our story here. So for each molecule of ATP hydrolyzed, this transporter transports three sodium ions out of a cell and two potassium ions into a cell. And there's going to be a net transfer of positive charge to the outside of a cell. That's the primary active transport. Let's move on to the secondary active transport. Okay, this is quite overwhelming <laughs> to look at, so let's slow down for a second. Here's our transporter protein. In secondary active transport, what we're gonna do, a second molecule, often an organic food like glucose or an amino acid, is transported together with an ion as it moves down its electrochemical gradient. So this beautiful blue molecule here is the solute being transported. Transporters that facilitate secondary active transport contain two binding sites, one for the second substance and one for an ion, usually but not always sodium. For this example, we're using sodium. Let's go through this. The electrochemical gradient for sodium is directed towards the cell because of the larger concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid. There are more sodium ions outside the cell as well as an excess negative charges present inside the cell, okay? And the other substance or solute to be transported must be transported against its concentration gradient. We're going uphill, okay? From an area of low concentration to an area of higher concentration. An example here is amino acids, like we mentioned before. The binding site of sodium increases the affinity of the binding site for this solute, which needs to be moved. And the transporter alters its shape, exposing both binding sites to the intracellular side of the membrane. As the transporter's affinity for sodium decreases with conformational change, sodium enters the intracellular fluid through simple diffusion along its electrochemical gradient. Okay, and the solute is released into the intracellular fluid as the affinity of the solute binding site declines. And once both molecules have been released by the transporter, the protein returns to its initial state. Okay, the cell then maintains the electrochemical gradient for sodium by primary active transport, as the sodium is actively transported back out of the cell and the solute here that we've moved stays inside the cell. Beautiful process. Now, when the movement of the actively transported solute is in the same direction as sodium, 
into the cell. This is known as co-transport. And when it's in the opposite direction as sodium out of the cell, this is known as counter transport. Okay, so to recap primary and secondary active transport, secondary active transport moves both an iron and a second solute across a plasma membrane using the stored energy of an electrochemical gradient. Okay, and primary active transport directly uses ATP. It's phosphorylating itself. And primary active transporters are what usually create and maintain the electrochemical gradient. Wow, okay, we've covered a lot so far. Before we move on, let's summarize everything we've covered. So there are two types of transport, diffusion and mediated transport. For diffusion, it's either through the lipid bilayer, simple diffusion, or through protein channels. And for mediated transport, we have facilitated diffusion, primary active transport, and secondary active transport. Facilitated diffusion is still under diffusion, but because we're using a transport system, it also falls under mediated transport, okay? First up, the direction of flux. You've got this for diffusion. It's high to low concentration. We're going downhill. In, this also includes facilitated diffusion. And for active transport, it's low to high concentration. We're going against the concentration gradient. We're pumping substances uphill, okay? The next one, use of membrane protein, integral membrane protein. Simple diffusion doesn't use membrane proteins, and the rest of these, they use a membrane protein, okay? Molecule examples for simple diffusion, nonpolar molecules such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and fatty acids. Diffusion through channel proteins occurs specifically for ions such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. Facilitated diffusion is also specific, an example being glucose, okay? Then for active transport, then for active transport, for primary active transport, it's specific and requires energy. Examples include ions such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. Now for secondary active transport, it's also specific, but for the energy source, it's an ion gradient, usually sodium. Examples include large polar molecules such as amino acids, glucose, and some ions. Okay, that's diffusion and mediated transport. Let's now move on to osmosis, which is the net diffusion of water across semi-permeable membranes. Recall the structure of water. It's a polar molecule and the diffusion of water is mediated by aquaporins, which are a class of membrane proteins that create channels through which water can diffuse. Osmosis is quite similar to diffusion, in which there is a difference in water concentration. Water moves from an area of low solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration, okay? A solute is atoms, ions, or molecules dissolved in a liquid. And the total amount of particles dissolved in the solution determines the rate of osmosis. Let's break this down. Here we have a U-shaped tube containing two sugar solutions of different concentrations, and they are separated by a membrane that water, which is our solvent, can pass through, but our solute, which is sugar, can't, okay? Now, the water molecules will diffuse from the solution with less concentrated solute to that with more concentrated solute, more sugar molecules. And this passive transport of water is known as osmosis. Now, it's important to note that the number of particles, molecules, or ions of the solute in solution, okay, the solute concentration, not the chemical makeup of the solute, determines how much the water concentration is reduced by the addition of the solute, okay? For example, one mole of glucose in one liter of solution reduces the water concentration to the same level as does one mole of any other molecule that exists as a single particle in solution, okay? It's not about the chemical nature of the molecule. And there's a term that's used to refer to the entire concentration of solute particles in a solution regardless of their chemical nature. That term is called osmolarity. The osmolarity of a solute is a measurement of its total solute concentration. So one mole of solute particles is equal to one 
Osmo. When it comes to salts though, such as sodium chloride, when they dissociate into their single particles, there would be one mole of sodium ions and one mole of chloride ions, producing two mole of solute particles. So it's not about the chemical nature of the solute, it's about the number of particles, okay? Therefore, a liter of solution containing one mole of glucose and one mole of sodium chloride has an osmolarity of three, okay? But osmolarity also determines the water concentration in the solution because the higher the osmolarity, the lower the water concentration. And the net diffusion of water occurs through a semi-permeable membrane from a diluted to a concentrated solution along the water's own concentration gradient, which is known as the osmotic gradient. Okay, so water will flow to the area with the highest concentration of solutes. And the pressure causing the water to move along this gradient is called osmotic pressure. The greater the osmolarity of a solution, the greater the osmotic pressure. Simply put, the higher the osmotic pressure, the more water that moves across the membrane. Now, in osmosis, we are always comparing solute concentrations between two solutions. This is where the terms isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solution come in. Changes in extracellular osmolarity can cause cells to shrink or swell as water moves across the plasma membrane. This leads us to the concept of tonicity, which is the ability of a surrounding solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. And as we mentioned before, both the solute concentration and the membrane permeability play a role in this. If a cell without a cell wall, such as an animal cell, we have a gorgeous red blood cell here, let's go through this. If we place this cell in an environment or solution that is isotonic, to the cell, there will be no net movement of water across the plasma membrane. So this cell will neither shrink nor swell because the water concentrations in the intracellular and extracellular fluids are the same. Iso means same. Okay, so isotonic solutions have the same concentrations of non-penetrating solutes as normal extracellular fluid, equal concentrations of solutes. Think isotonic, meaning same, okay? Now, if we were to move the cell to a solution that is hypertonic to the cell, hyper means more, okay? More pe non-penetrating solutes, the cell will shrink or shrivel as water diffuses out of the cell into the fluid with the lower water concentration. Water is going to move from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration, which is why the cell will shrink or shrivel, just like our red blood cell here. And lastly, if we place the cell in a solution that is hypotonic to the cell, hypo means less, the solute concentration is lower than that found in cells, water is going to move by osmosis into the cells, causing the cell to swell, okay? So those are the isotonic, hypertonic, and hypertonic solutions. The control of solute concentrations and water balance is called osmoregulation, okay? All right, that's the water balance of cells without a cell wall. For cells that are surrounded by cell walls, such as plants, these cells are firm or turgid and in a healthy state when they are in a hypertonic environment, okay? But if a plant cell and surroundings are isotonic, iso meaning same, the cells become limp or flaccid and the plant wilts. And if we place it in a hypertonic environment, the plant cell will lose water to its surroundings and it's going to shrink. This is called plasmolysis, okay? Plasmolysis. The plant wilts and can lead to plant death. This also applies to bacteria and fungi, okay? All right, we've covered a lot. That's osmosis. Let's do a quick recap before we move on to bulk transport. Isotonic, iso meaning same, a solution that does not cause a change in a cell volume, equal solute concentrations. Again, I'm going to keep repeating it, iso means same. Hypertonic, 
hyper meaning more, is a solution that causes cell to shrink. There's a higher concentration of solute. Think hyper, more. And hypertonic is a solution that causes cell to swell. Okay, hyper means low. There's a lower concentration of solute. Okay, that's osmosis. Let's move on to the next part of this lecture, and that is bulk transport, endocytosis and exocytosis. Let's go through this. This is another pathway by which substances, more specifically large molecules such as proteins and polysaccharides, as well as cellular waste, can enter or leave cells. In endocytosis, the cell takes in materials in bulk by forming new vesicles from the plasma membrane. What happens is a small region of the plasma membrane sinks inwards to form a pocket, and the materials are enclosed by the membrane, which then pinches off to form a vesicle. And this vesicle transports the substances to where they are required within the cell. And the reverse process is called exocytosis. Membrane-bound vesicles in the cytoplasm fuse with the plasma membrane and release their contents to the outside of the cell. Let's break down endocytosis first. There are three types of endocytosis, pinocytosis, phagocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. We have our plasma membrane here, and these green circles and blue triangles are our solutes. Pinocytosis, or cell drinking, this is also called fluid endocytosis. This process is non-specific because the membrane engulfs the water in the extracellular fluid that contains solutes such as ions or nutrients and any other dissolved molecules. Okay, that's pinocytosis. The next type is phagocytosis. Phagocytosis or cell eating. The cell is going to engulf a solid material, bacteria or large particles that will be digested when the food vacuole fuses with a lysosome containing enzymes. We covered lysosomes in the cell structure and function lecture. Now there are extensions of the plasma membrane called pseudopodia that fold around the surface of the particle and taking it in entirely. The ingested contents of the pseudopodia are then fused to form phagosomes, which are ingested into the cell. And from here, okay, once we've ingested it, lysosomal enzymes break down the contents of the phagosomes. Then the last type is receptor-mediated endocytosis. It engulfs specific substances. Protein receptors located in the surface of the plasma membrane responds to particular molecules, okay? So a cell recognizes a specific ligand, our blue triangle here, that bind to a plasma membrane receptor. This is our receptor here, this Y-shaped, and this binding triggers endocytosis, okay? That's endocytosis. We have pinocytosis, phagocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Let's move on to exocytosis. Exocytosis serves two purposes for cells. Number one, it allows for the replacement of the plasma membrane that endocytosis has removed and also adds new membrane components. And number two, it offers a pathway for the secretion of membrane impermeable molecules, such as protein hormones that the cell produces. In the cell structure and function lecture, we cover how the cell packages substances that are to be exported. For this lecture, let's briefly go through this. Secretory proteins, such as hormones or enzymes, are proteins that are produced to be exported out of a cell. Once we've synthesized a secretory protein, it's transported through the rough endoplasmic reticulum where it's modified. A great example is when a secretory protein becomes a glycoprotein, meaning carbohydrates are added to the protein. So here we have our rough endoplasmic reticulum with ribosomes studded on it. Then these proteins are wrapped in the membranes of vesicles that bud off from the ER, okay? This right here. Vesicles that move from one part of the cell to another are called transport vesicles. The rough ER also produces transmembrane proteins, which is pretty cool, okay? Then after it leaves the ER, the transport vesicles travel and fuse with the Golgi apparatus at the cis base. A Golgi stack receives and dispatches transport vesicles and the products they contain. It has structural and functional directionality 
with a cis phase that receives vesicles containing ER products and a trans phase that dispatches vesicles. Okay, now the Golgi consists of flattened sacs called cystinae. Okay, and the secretory proteins are going to move from one cystinate to the next carried by vesicles. And as it moves through the Golgi, it gets modified. So for example, the carbohydrate on the glycoproteins, the Golgi may remove some sugar subunits and replace them with others. All right, then when the secretory proteins are ready for secretion, secretory vesicles containing the protein butt off from the transphase, okay, this right here, of the Golgi and move to the plasma membrane where the product is released out of the cell via exocytosis. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!